And that's a, a really, really nice, uh, well thought out performance. Now, what I want to do with you this morning is to consider the things that are maybe different about how Schubert might, would have expected that to be played in, 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 the, in the, uh, the performing practices of his time. There are a couple of things which are most definitely missing from modern practice that we can seriously think about incorporating. One of those is the tempo rubato. Now, you do quite a bit of holding back um, and uh, manipulating the tempo, but that's a, a tempo flexibility which doesn't depend upon rubato. Rubato, strictly speaking, is when you bend some notes and then recover the amount of time that you've lost and get back to the set to the right place without the other parts necessarily having to follow you. So that's a really useful thing which we can try. The other thing is that Schubert's musicians would almost certainly have used a great deal more portamento, sliding, than you do. Now, we think of sliding as being a bad habit that, that um, the old musicians used to do, but towards the end of the 18th century, it became a really important expressive device. It was imitating the singer's portamento. And in Schubert's time, it was really, really important. We know, for instance, that Ignaz Schuppensich, the violinist who played all of Beethoven's quartets under Beethoven's direction, and also played some of Schubert's late chamber music, used a great deal of portamento. Um, it's documented. They also used very different kinds of tempo flexibility than we are using today. And so that's a, a, a first point that we could, should try. Um, I'm not going to talk very much about vibrato. You have a very nice control of vibrato. You don't use as much of it as we used to use 30 years ago. Um, you're using it much more subtly. Um, there are probably things we can do, and I might mention a, a few of them, but we won't focus too much on that. The other thing that I think is really important, and, I, and we talked about this when you were rehearsing Haydn yesterday, that um, the music is telling us a story. I'm sure you feel that. It's, it's a kind of ballad in this case. It's, it reminds you of so many of Schubert's songs. And so we need to be very conscious of the shifting feelings and emotions in that music um, and to try and, and make as much as we can of them. Let's tackle the beginning, first of all. Um, it's all very easy for us just to play exactly what's written on the page. Da-da-dee-da-dee-da-da-da in the accompaniment there and put a little on from the viola and the cello. The question is really, should that all be perfectly together as we play it now? Um, if you had asked Josef Joachim, who was a pupil of Josef Böhm, who also played with Schubert, he would have certainly said no to you. And he might have given you um, this kind of answer. This is actually um, recorded by somebody who studied under Joachim and his colleagues at the Berlin Hochschule. And it's about this quartet um, as a whole. And it is that the ta da 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 should not actually be played strictly on the fourth beat of the bar. It should be played much more freely. So the two of you would have to work together to be able to feel that together. And you should feel the bar in two, not in four. Pam, pam, pa da 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 And let, and let the, the four little notes happen where they really want to happen, not where the music tells you they should happen. Um, it's a wonderful account in Marion Rankin's book on, on the teaching at the Hochschule in, in the early years of the 20th century. And you can look it up for yourselves on the internet. It's well worth looking at. And the, the description of, of this flexibility ends with the, the comment that if anybody had questioned it and said, well, Schubert didn't write it like that, the answer would have been, well, how could he have written it if he wanted that? <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's the important point. This kind of expressive flexibility was part of their way of feeling music. We still maybe get it in some forms of music these days, in some forms of jazz, where you have that flexibility. It was ironed out of classical practice during the 20th century because people started to believe that the composer's intention was embodied in the notation, not in the message that lay behind the notation. OK, now the first thing I'd say, I think, is that I, I think your tempo's a tiny bit slow. Um, the Viennese Allegro in the early 19th century was very fast, and the Allegro Manon Troppo was not very slow either. <laughs> so I think it should probably flow a bit more, yeah? 
And we should not be frightened of getting faster when the music gets exciting and then holding it back. You do a lot of holding back, but you hardly ever go forward. Yeah? And there are, a few, there are a few guides as well in the notation towards this. Whenever you have these hairpins, um, what we call hairpins in English, these gabeln in German, uh, the, that go upwards, in other words, crescendo, it need not only be a crescendo of volume, but also a crescendo of tempo. Yeah? So you can tend to hurry on those. Um, and usually that's what you do. Occasionally, for a special effect, you might slow down on them, but that's a very special effect. And the same thing would then follow from the um, hairpins at the end. Did you notice, by the way, that Schubert uses two terms for getting softer in this piece? Decrescendo and diminuendo. When he writes decrescendo, he means to get softer, but he doesn't mean to get slower, significantly. When he writes diminuendo, he actually means ritardando as well. Um, that's well documented. Um, if you go to Walter Dürer's writing in the, in the Schubert Gesamtausgabe, you'll find the information for that. Mm. And there's one particular place where we have that diminuendo, which is quite important. Anyway, let's go back to the beginning. Let's start again. Now, see whether you can do what the cellist Hausmann recommended to his students in the chamber music classes at the Hochschule in Berlin. Um, see whether you can be free with your da 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 Just play it where it belongs. Give it a sort of mysterious quality, not a mechanical quality. And also, sorry, before you start there, in the second violin part, I think you should not play ta da 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 di da 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 but ta da di da di da 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 di da di da di da 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 like, like, really like water, waves. At the second violin, it reminds me, does it remind you of a, of a Schubert song? Ja di da 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 di da. It's very similar to the Gretchen am Spinnrad, this, yeah. this restless feeling. And I think with a little faster tempo, you get really this wow, restless feeling, not too comfortable. violin once. Um, but remember what the first violin is doing. Just have that me me melody in your head, but now play this in a really free sense. Okay, so, so in the second violin, I think we just need more dynamic change. Shouldn't be predictable. It mustn't always be the same. But it has to go up and down. Yeah, great, great, great. Now let's put the first violin back with that again. Okay, sorry. Let, let, let's start again. Let's just go a bit faster. Yeah? That's all. I think the second violin could be a little more. Yeah. So we really. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I still I still there's not enough anxiety in your part. It's a mysterious, slightly anxious quality to it. Yeah, and good, good, good. We're nearly there, we're nearly there. And sometimes a little bit more time on the first note. But not always the same. Yeah? But a few times you should almost play a dotted rhythm on those first two notes.
Okay. Good. And, and in the bars where you have the, the upward hairpins, the tempo just moves forward and then comes back again a little bit. Yeah? Yeah? Um, don't go too loud in that, though. Um, and the second one, tee da tee, tee da tee, you could actually do the opposite and take time. Yeah? So the first one, tee da tee, da tee, yeah? And then take time on the other one. But really pianissimo. What I'd suggest, actually, I suggest a particular use of the bow here. Um, this is another thing that was said about Joachim's playing, which I think is really interesting to know, which is that when he had pianissimo, he would play with more bow than when he had piano. And he would play with a light, almost flautando bow stroke to create a different quality of sound. Try that, using really very much bow, very lightly. That's really nice. So at that point where I, where I said it, uh, I think the music needs to move in tempo forwards a little bit more than you did. And when you get to that place where in the first violin you shift with the second finger, don't try to disguise that slide. Yeah. The very first time you played it, it I could, didn't really hear it at all because you were very subtle with the bow to make it disappear. But it's an expressive gesture. It's actually there in the Ferdinand David edition from the middle of the 19th century, um, and some more, that which I'll tell you about as we get to them, some portamenti, which add a lot to the vocal quality. I mean, even in the beginning, we, we don't make slides, but we have in our mind this subtle connection that a singer would make in that melody. And then sometimes we have a more expressive gesture with the portamento. Um, let's go from... Let's, uh, sorry, I have to just find the place in the score. Um, Let's just go in at bar 11. We'll try the, we'll try the speeding up again another time. So can we try that? Can we try, just try that speeding up again? Um, um, I think speed up until bar 17, and then relax again, back to the tempo. Try that. That bar is a place for a bit of ruba. Ya da ti da dum. So the third beat of the bar probably wants to be longer, but you have to recover it so you get to the bar line at the right place. And it might be that you could play the third beat a bit early. Ti da tai da dum. Playing a little bit early is very, very common in, in 19th century practice, and we still hear it on many of the early recordings of the old players. And it's very, very effective in the right place. Yeah. That, that, that's, that's, that's nice. Now, um, w one other quick suggestion to make to you about bar 11 following. The beginning, the pianissimo is probably most beautiful without vibrato, yeah. with this floating sound. And I think that should continue until you get the sforzanti. Because you did vibratos which anticipated the sforzanti and therefore took away the effect of them. Yeah? So I think there, do, do keep the vibrato under. Oh, okay, so like, okay, okay. I, I would say that from bars 11, 12, 13, 14, uh, you don't want to have any vibrato, and then on the sforzando, wah, you get the vibrato, and it makes an effect. Mm -hmm. could, could we maybe like try something with 
Yeah, of course you can. Yes. I'm still not quite sure about this accompaniment. I think you should be freer in the cello and, and viola. Just try to think one, two, da 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 da. <laughs> Just try that on your own. <laughs> It's too, it's too late, so it's just started a little bit early. Tom, ta da 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 da. <laughs> yeah, st I'm still just hearing da 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 da. Yeah, I'm still just really hearing very rhythmical sixteenth notes. Relax more. Ta da da da. Yeah. Try to, f yeah, okay, it, doesn't, yeah. it doesn't matter. Being together was not something that was terribly, terribly important to these people. There's a fascinating review from the 1860s of the Wing Quartet, who were a brilliant quartet of four brothers, um, played wonderfully together, and their ensemble was always praised as being perfect. And somebody had just heard them play the Haydn uh, Kaiser Quartet and said it was a wonderfully and perfect ensemble, but somehow I think something was lost by that. <laughs> In the 1860s, they were still conscious of this flexibility that allows things not to be quite together. And if you think about the pianists of the time, who were simply spreading all the chords, then you can imagine something similar. It's perfectly possible in the string quartet. So you don't play that where it's written, you play it where it feels right. But of course, at the moment, it feels right where it's written, because that's how we've been brought up. But now try to get yourself into a freer mood. Yeah, that's, that's coming. It's, it has, yeah, that has, a, that has an emotional yeah. feeling to it's it. Lingering on the first note. Yeah. 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 That's nice. The first note can come a little bit early and be a bit long. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. That's it. Great. And, and now you. And you are now shaping this accompaniment, this You're creating an atmosphere for yes. us. I think it would help to close your eyes and try to invent this Spinrad Gretchen. I think that helps. Yeah, so, no, sorry, sorry to see, keep stopping you, but wh what it is is that you can't get out of your mind the fact that they are equal notes. Uh, you, can go, you can be as flexible as playing a dotted rhythm instead of two equal notes. You can go as much as that, though not always, and just only occasionally as a special one. Very often you can tripletize it. Make it almost like triplets, like you would in jazz. <laughs> jazz players would always play triplets in a, ca in a case like that. But you don't want to be regular. You want to be irregular, but expressive. Let's stop there. Let's try some more portamento. Um, there's a couple of beautiful portamentos you could do, which are marked by David in his edition. Um, the first one is... Where is the minister? I'll, just, I'll, just, I'll bring this over to show you. Um, so we're in, we're in the first position here. Mm -hmm. And at this point, he plays 4-4. Four, four. Oh. Uh, and then he goes back down to the 2 on the C-sharp. 
Two, okay. So try that. So the yeah, just try it on your own, first of all. So this is the first position. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then, okay. So maybe we try the whole of that line mm -hmm. with David's fingering. Okay, but it shouldn't be combined with a continuous vibrato. Yeah? The vibrato should be saved up for the most important notes, but oh. not be continuous. Because if you start combining vibrato and portamento, it begins to get over-sentimental. And it might be one of the reasons why the portamento disappeared with the continuous vibrato coming in, in the 20th century. Shall I not then use vibrato here? Right? No, probably not. Okay. And use an open string. Okay. Of course, on the A, on the, on the, yeah. Ah, oh, but not, ah, yeah, a vibrato, if you like, on the G sharp, but not on the F sharp that follows it. Ah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because also there's a diminuendo. Yeah, okay, so that's technically how to do it, but then you have to make it expressive. It has to be, it has to tell the story. So it has to be appropriate to that particular moment. That was probably too much the f when you played it there. Let's do it with the, with the accompaniment so that we can get the feeling of that. Um, that would be um, the lead-in to bar 20, 1, 2, 3. And there's another place where it seems to me that this section requires a slightly different tempo. Carl Jenny, Beethoven's pupil, talks in his, his piano school about how almost every line of a piece of music has its own tempo. And th this was certainly something, again, that the Schuppenzig Ensemble did. In fact, in 1825, there was a, a review um, criticizing them for doing even more tempo flexibility than they had been doing before, to the point at which it became ridiculous. <laughs> um, now, that's very, very interesting, because Beethoven himself actually worked with them and told them what he wanted them to do. So he was clearly telling them to do these tempo flexibilities, but they went sometimes a bit too far. But not to do them at all is, is very bad for the music. Yeah? So at that point, it seems to me there's a sudden increase in tempo. Because something else is happening in the drama. I, that's the really important thing. What is the drama about? What are the incidents in the drama? Okay. You have to create these pictures in the mind of your listener. So let's go back to the same place. Uh, do the little upbeat as well. Ta 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 ti. Um, and then we go uh, really, really change the character of the music at that point.
Okay, good. Um, maybe that slowing down at the end there is not what Schubert had in mind, because he doesn't write diminuendo, he writes decrescendo. So he probably... And you can see that that could also tell a story. And it's, maybe it's a more interesting story than the other one, because the other one is very predictable. And one of the things about giving a really exciting performance is always to keep your audience on the edge of their seats, wondering what is going to happen next. And if, if they think, oh, yeah, that's what I expected, that's not so good. Yeah? <laughs> try, to, try to tease them a little bit as well with the story. You remember, I mean, a good have in mind a good storyteller, someone who relates a story. And when it gets exciting, they start to move on. They, t they tell it faster. And then when there's something mysterious, they speak more slowly. And the music is like that, too. It's, the story is written down in, in, in words, and it doesn't have any tempos. The music is written down as it only can be written down in rather precise notation. But that precise notation is not what the composer actually wants you to do. Yeah? And you have a wonderful free field. Um, I, your portamentos, you could do more now, and especially when you came down to the C sharp. That could be a very expressive gesture. Yeah. Okay, never mind, we won't do that again. Let's go back just a little bit from where we stopped there. Um, well, let's go, go straight in at bar 32. That was really good. No, I, I, I wasn't necessarily wanting to stop, but I was just thinking to myself there, those three, those chords, yeah? Maybe they do want to be very, maybe they do want to be very exact, or maybe they don't want to start quite exact. Um, pum, 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 pum. Something, something needs to happen with them. They shouldn't just be tum, tum, tum. But I don't know, let's, let's, let's try, let's go back to four. Uh, 30, um, 38. <laughs> yeah? So you actually maybe think of them as in a new, slightly faster tempo than where you finished. Yeah? It's very good. It's not only a cadence, but it's really no mercy. Bah, bah, bah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, something has happened it's in that really story, great, yeah. hasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> one, more, one more time, same place. Oh, actually, sorry, before you start. Um, when you have sliding semitones, where you use the same finger, really do it slowly, so we actually do. They, they were really keen on that. It goes all the way through to Wagner and other later 19th century composers. Semitones being slid portamento is wonderful. In bar, in bar uh, 52, second violin, don't just play give the first note a lot more length and then hurry the ones that follow it. And the same, you can obviously do similar things in the other parts. Let's go from uh, uh, bar 49. Maybe 
maybe, maybe just be, try, try, try a different way of doing that. Try going actually almost f faster at the end rather than slowing down. And leave us, leave us with a big question mark. Yeah, I mean, there's every possibility there. Uh, what you did the first time is a possibility, and, and it works, but it does maybe it tells a different story. So you have, to, you have to be clear about what story you're telling. I think that's really important. It's not, <laughs> it's not that you, you feel it afterwards, it's that you feel it before, that you know the story, and you know how you want to express the story. And that, that'll come for you, in, you know, the, the more you rehearse the piece, the more you will actually settle into a conception of that story. And then you will convey it. But uh, maybe I said this to you in the last rehearsal, but there's the wonderful comment by the viola player of Joachim's quartet about how it was so difficult to play with the old man. Always a different rhythm, always a different tempo. Mm -hmm. So there's, that, there's also that element of improvised flexibility that you don't really quite know how you're going to do it in each performance. So you have to force your colleagues to follow you. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but each one of you has, has the possibility to do that. I mean, we, we've already heard how Hausmann in the, in, in the beginning of this quartet took freedoms which make a huge difference. Yeah? Okay, let's do it one more time and go on this time. suggestion actually about that which is that in this bar the indication of Schubert, Schubert's notation might suggest that actually you want to speed up in that bar yeah I tried I yeah. so you don't you don't hesitate about getting to the top note okay. yeah? try that one more time Now, how are we going to create this dolce feeling here? It's a, different, it's a different bit. It's a totally different part of the story. Something's happened. Now we're going back to another point in the story. How are you going to do the dolce? You're going to uh, improvise. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's, it's probably the right, both the left hand and the right hand mm -hmm. that you need to use here. And one thing it would be, again, we know that Joachim used to use rather more vibrato. He didn't use vibrato very much but he did use more vibrato in a dolce. And so maybe a, a delicate finger vibrato, not a wide vibrato of pitch, but a delicate finger vibrato, mm -hmm. a really quite noticeable one. That would be one thing. And then maybe, to, again, to use the bow a little bit more in a floating way. Uh, let's, let's go straight in at the dolce. probably wouldn't hang around as much as you did on that one, but that's a personal thing. Okay. So but never mind. But it's, it's worth thinking about. It's very conventional, what you did there. It's what I would expect to hear, and therefore I kind of don't like it. Okay. But okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And it's perfectly possible do something more ardent. Yeah? Has one effect. Has another effect. And it's worth thinking about all of those. And maybe you'll surprise your colleagues by doing one one time and the other another time. Mm -hmm. um, now, when we get to this section, um, you know, I talked yesterday in, in relation to Haydn about the bow strokes and things. Um, 
there's no, almost no likelihood that Schubert would have expected those bow strokes to be played down here in the bow. Um, he would have expected them to be played with a broad detaché stroke. Now, broad detaché was taught at that time in the early 19th century in the Paris Conservatoire method, in various German methods. There's one Viennese method, in fact, um, which, which teaches that. Um, and it is played in the third quarter of the bow with as much bow as you possibly can use. Mm -hmm. yeah? So let's try from the, it's just the viola and the cello at that point, let's, let's try that section beginning there immediately. Okay, so as much bow as you can use, from the middle to the three quarters part, point. Great, okay. But then you, s you have to say, I don't want to play every single note with the same degree of force. Um, I need some notes to come out more. Yada di 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 di. And also with a slight more flexibility of rhythm, yeah? Otherwise, it gets like an exercise. That was really nice. You did, that was fantastic. You played with much, much more expression that time. And I like the fact that you played ya ta 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 tum twice, each one of you, and then you play ya ta 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 tum. That was great, because it's, it's again uh, something I talked about yesterday with you about the fact that when something is repeated exactly, you don't play it exactly the same. Always this sense of keeping the thing alive. Yeah? So let's try that with everybody. go back over that a little bit. Here's another place where I think there are a few places where you could bring more, make more expression with the portamento. Yeah? Uh, yeah. yeah? Um, may, I, may I see what fingerings he used? Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking... Uh, yeah? Here? Yeah? Yeah, yeah. And also here. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, but that, then you're doing a French portamento. And they would never have allowed that in German practice. There's two kinds of portamento. One is where you go up with the finger that you started with. Yeah? That one goes all the way, and then you play the other finger. And then the French portamento is where you go with the finger that's coming for the second note and slide that up. Mm -hmm. And that would have been, you'd have been if you'd been uh, studying in a German conservatoire in the 19th century, you'd have been thrown out if you did that. <laughs> <laughs> OK? That's it, yeah. Uh, if you want to know more about this, look at the Spohr Violin Schule, 1833. He has great detail about exactly how to do the portamenti. Um, and Spohr, of course, was a central figure. He was a friend of Beethoven. He spent time in Vienna to, as the second to, uh, conductor of the uh, orchestra of the Theater an der Wien. Um, he played all his string quartets there. He played Beethoven's string quartets. I don't think he ever played any Schubert, but Schubert would have known about him and probably heard him. Okay, so well, let's just, let's go back a little bit then to. Um, have you got? Uh, wait a minute. Yeah, uh, let's go from bar eighty-one. Mm -hmm. So this this again is another section of the music which has a different character. Mm -hmm. 
You have to, you have to find that character in yourself and express it to us. trills, I think they should start from above, but I don't think they should start with an appoggiatura, a long appoggiatura. ta ti ta ti ti still, still a long appoggiatura. But but we've got we've got one of these double hairpins, haven't we? Yada di da da da. When uh, there are accounts of Brahms's playing, and Brahms is said always to linger, even to make the whole bar longer on on those kinds of hairpins. That was a tradition which he'd clearly inherited from the early 19th century. Just try that. Isn't it in one bow? Yeah. Isn't it in one bow? Yeah. Play it in one bow. Yeah, it makes all the difference. Yeah. 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 Isn't that certainly no less than that? Yeah, really beautiful. And what is the story we're telling here? I mean, you can't you can't possibly put it into words, but I I hope you really feel what it is, all of you. Yeah. Now now feel it even more strongly and put it across to me. That's very nice, but I'll tell you the other thing, which is that I don't think, don't think you should hesitate at the ends of the slurs. I think that the, it should be one long legato line. Oh. That was another thing that was very, very important to the musicians of that time, the legato. It had become much more important in the late 18th century, and in Be Beethoven's Vienna, he was noted, in fact, for being a marvellous exponent of the legato. Mm -hmm. And the same would be true, I'm sure, of Schubert. case of where a, a, a musical unit is repeated. Yeah? So the repetition has to have a different character. It's not just, I mean, it's boring when somebody says the same thing twice in succession without any reason. So why does he do it? He wants it to grow from one expression of the idea to another. Now try and give it a different character. Try one more time. So that was a master class by <laughs> Professor Cliff Brown. <laughs> okay, that was a master class live from Reichenaut is uh, in the south part of Vienna in Austria. Yeah, because there is a summer academy of University of Music and Performing Arts Vienna, and there are a lot of workshops, lectures, and concert performance which various kind of music in this month in, in Reichenau. Uh, it's a castle, it's a very nice castle there in the outside of the 
capitals of Austria. So we can see how Professor Cliff Bau, he, he, was, uh, he is an expert about classical and romantic performance practice. He wrote a very good book about classical and romantic performance practice. We have it in our libraries in PGVIM. Yeah, this is very good that he combined his knowledge about how Schubert or Mozart or Beethoven should do those kind of performance, which is not notated in the scores. Yeah, but it's like a common practice that uh, musicians at that time know how to do. But after, even after 50 years life from Chopin time, those tradition was slightly forgotten. Yeah, and of course for after 200 years, yeah, as we can see that in the 21st recordings, there are many, let's say, modern pianists or modern musicians uh, probably didn't regard on that tradition. Yeah. Like when we listen to the Thai singing style, if we listen to the recording for 80 years ago, the singing technique is different than nowadays. So that the tradition changed. Yeah. And in my opinion, for nowadays, if we perform and we research on the traditional practice, like 200 years ago, we can hear something new and unfamiliar for us. Even it probably was like that before. Yeah. So this is a new aspect from researching the past. Yeah. So at least we should know how they might perform 200 years ago and try to think, OK, nowadays, what should we do? For instance, uh, maybe we can combine with the improvisation techniques in our piano playing, as Professor Han ming uh, mentioned about and gave some examples that the musicians at that time was not only performers, but he can improvise and he, they were composers as well. Yeah. So like in jazz music, right? Nowadays and pop music, right? Okay, so thank you very much for the University of Music and Performing Art, Vienna to collaborate this session with us, and we hope for the further collaborations and all the best. Thank you. <laughs>